in 1900, women were second-class citizens, denied the right to vote, the right to open bank accounts, take bank loans. They had a hard time gaining tertiary education. Marriage was seen as the only career for middle-class women. Working-class girls worked like dogs. They left school at 13 or 14, worked as housemaids or shop girls from dawn to dusk, married young, and as there was no contraceptive advice, it was actually illegal to sell contraceptives, they could raise as many as 14, 16 children on the wages of a working man, which were very small. Men did all the really interesting things. Men controlled the law, medicine, the arts, science-related subjects, Sport was exclusively male. Women were banned from the Olympics until 1912, and then they were only allowed to enter the swimming and the archery because it was seen as immoral for women to be seen in public perspiring. The law treated them like children or domestic pets. And so they really had a great deal to overcome in order to get any sort of parity with men. The thought that they could possibly be paid the same seemed ludicrous at the time. They were paid half the wages of a man for doing the same job. So women wanted a wide range of things, ranging from more independence to better working conditions. In 1900, all Australian women received the federal vote as part of federation. And in 1905, Queensland became the second last Australian state to grant women the right to vote in state elections. Obtaining the vote was the key to financial independence for women. It was part of a gradual process of change which would affect the lives of all women. But don't think for a moment that getting the vote changed things overnight. It didn't. Emma Miller, who did a great deal to change things and get the vote for women. I'm sure she's very good looking when she was young. She had three husbands, and so clearly somebody found her good looking. And uh, she's got rather sad eyes, if you look, and she had every reason to be sad, really. She had a very tough life. Her childhood took place among the dark satanic mills of northern England. Her father was a poorly paid rope maker, a labour supporter, who took Emma along with him to trades union meetings and marches. Like most working class girls, she left school at 14 and then she had to help her parents feed a large family. In her day there were no scholarships for girls who were clever as she was and so she had to sew shirts for a living. Her first husband died when she was young, and she had to support three children by sewing shirts, working from home 11 or 12 hours a day for a pittance. She married again, this time to a stonemason, and in search of a better life, she migrated to Brisbane with her second husband. It was 1890. Queensland was emerging from a long drought. There was widespread unemployment, so it wasn't really much of a better life. And she had to work in a garment sweatshop. And there in the sweatshop, working long hours a day, not even allowed a place to go and sit and eat her lunch, but forced to eat at the machine, she organized marches of women to demand the vote in order to get better condition, working conditions. The other thing she wanted was um, redress against sexual harassment of young women in these sweatshops by the male supervisors. She spoke with conviction. Really, the parliamentarians didn't know how to deal with her. She led a march of women on Parliament House, not a dangerous rabble, an orderly meeting, but they bring out the police horses onto them to control them. And she becomes famous as a rebel. Does anyone know how? The answer is a hat pin. The police are advancing on them, the mounted police advancing on them. 
Faced with this line of mounted police, she takes the hat pin out of her hat. Well, now I'm a horse lover. I don't approve of sticking hat pins in your horse's sides. She does, and she stops the police advancing on them. The policeman falls off the horse, the bright line break, and so the women can go on and present their petition to Parliament. And so when she dies, she dies in her 90s, the flags are flown at half-mast at Trades Hall. There is a big wall hanging now in Trades Hall in Brisbane celebrating Emma on her march with a line of women behind her facing the policeman and the police horse with the hat pin. Now the first Queensland woman to get take a seat in Parliament, Irene Longman. She stands for the seat of Belimba. She's a very good teacher. And this makes her very good when she stands for Parliament. She's good at controlling men who heckle her. <laughs> and um, she stands for the National Party in the electorate of Belimba in 1929. And her male opponent says, oh, I've only got a woman standing against me. She'll never get in. She hasn't got a hope. So he doesn't try very hard. She's a very good speaker. And she promises women that she will do her best to get free kindergartens, free um, baby clinics, you know, things to improve their lives. She gets in with quite a large majority, which, you know, shatters a male opponent. Because of her teaching um, career and her love for children, she wants to improve schools, she wants to get better books, you know, more books into libraries, she wants to get better teaching aids, she wants to get these kindergartens, playgrounds for women, and she wants to get women into the Queensland police force. And so all these measures she puts through in Parliament, she really um, does a great deal, but she's in in the 1930s, the Great Depression, the National Party are out after one term, and so she goes back to teaching. Now, she has used the Margaret Ogg Fund to get into Parliament, and so does Dame Annabel Rankin, who becomes Queensland's first female senator from 1947 to 1971.